Good morning, everybody. My name is Cristina Della Coletta. I am the Dean of the Division of Arts and Humanities. And uh, before we get started and get into the conversation, I'd like uh, for you to introduce yourselves, your name and role at UC San Diego and uh, your research focus. May we start with Manuel? Yeah, hi, um, I'm Manuel Vargas. I'm a professor of philosophy here at UC San Diego. I do work on free will, moral responsibility, a little bit of work in moral psychology, but uh, I am here today to talk about uh, maybe my favorite hobby horse, uh, Latin American philosophy, and in particular, Mexican philosophy. Great, thank you, Manuel. And Clinton? Hi, uh, yes, I'm Clinton Tolley, uh, also a professor in the philosophy department. Um, most of my uh, work has been engaging with traditions in modern philosophy, so philosophy roughly after around 1750 or so, that's how the term is used. Um, and then, yeah, uh, with an increasing focus on the inheritance of philosophical traditions, uh, the intersection of philosophical traditions coming out of Europe with uh, philosophy happening in the Americas. Uh, so yeah, so really excited to talk about these topics today uh, with, with the three of us. Great, it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, just to get us started, uh, um, can you explain what the philosophy of the Americas is and what is Latin American philosophy and what is Mexican philosophy? Yeah, great. Uh, maybe I'll start off with the, the, broad, the broad heading philosophy in the Americas. But what, one thing just to note within the discipline of philosophy, um, you know, philosophy in the Americas isn't a common title. So that's something that we've been forging together to try to pick out the distinctive topic that we're trying to get into view. So, um, you know, there's a tradition of teaching American philosophy classes, uh, although even that doesn't get that much airtime in curriculum and in research, which focuses largely on maybe four or five people who taught at Harvard or Columbia around the turn of the 20th century. Um, we're excited to have a perspective on what philosophy might mean as a part of the long history, uh, world historical events happening on these continents. And so that's, that will include thinking, uh, uh, critical reflection, uh, historical interpretation of the meaning of everything uh, by people who are here well before anything was happening in Europe in this direction. So, uh, and, and then everything from there till the present, <laughs> uh, including uh, figures that aren't always Placed within academic philosophy, but are clearly, you know, engaging in philosophical reflection on uh, questions about, obviously, you know, meaning of life, big picture stuff, but specifically what it means to be in this continent, especially in the last, you know, 400 years, 500 years. What's the, what even does it mean to, for America, the Americas to be the Americas? Um, so, that's that's a kind of broad description of philosophy in the Americas. What we're trying to uh, bring to the fore, get some spotlight on. And then more concretely, it divides up, you know, can divide up in a bunch of different ways. I think Manuel is gonna talk through, you know, how we're thinking of lines of approach that could bring out different configurations. So whether it focuses on geography, people groups, ethnicity, uh, nation state formation after a certain, you know, period, linguistic uh, relationships to, you know, Latin, uh, obviously in the name. Um, so, uh, and, and that itself, you know, just trying to categorize under philosophy in the Americas raises all kinds of interesting disciplinary questions about, you know, how, what are we thinking about with subcategories in philosophy, but Manuel, yeah, do you want to talk about some of the sub areas in this broad scheme that we're trying to develop? Sure. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I think there are a couple of different ways to think about uh, philosophy that has been produced in, in the Americas. And so one way to think about that is to just start with a pretty traditional canonical cut, where the thought is something like, what we do is we uh, look to the United States and what we see is roughly 120 years or so ago, you begin to see the emergence of philosophy as a discipline in the United States, you know, give or take 120 years, maybe you go back 200 years, but then we tell the story that way and, and it's interaction with the, the European tradition. There's a different way to tell the story, though, and I think that different way to tell the story, there's no one alternative way to tell the story, but this is uh, a part of what I think Clinton and I have both been very interested in doing, is finding alternative ways to tell the story of philosophy in the Americas. And one of the ways of telling that story is to focus on Latin America as a region, because Latin America has some roughly 500 years of history, uh, of, of the history of philosophy going on in it, 
that doesn't tend to get read, doesn't get, tend to get talked about in traditional or canonical uh, history of philosophy courses. So the, the one way of making that cut is to think about Latin America as a region, a uh, region spanning uh, you know, from the US-Mexico border all the way down to the tip of South America, and then to look at philosophical production that's happened in those regions. So that's gonna be traditionally philosophical work that was done in Spanish or in Portuguese, uh, languages that typically aren't studied by people in the United States or even in Europe as languages where you would, you would study them for the purpose of, of doing research in philosophy. So, uh, so there's a kind of rich, you know, roughly 500 year period of time of philosophy getting produced in those regions. Um, a different way of taking the cut is in the direction that Clinton was just gesturing at, where the thought goes, think about the Americas as a whole, including all the people that were here prior to the European colonization and ask, what kinds of abstract thinking was going on in, in, in all of those communities. And you end up with a different narrative of, uh, of that story. And then a third way you can try to cut it is to drill down into specific uh, regions. So one of the things that, that we have a lot of uh, expertise and enthusiasm about here at UCSD is in particular, the history of philosophy in Mexico. And, uh, and so you'll find in, in Mexico, both uh, indigenous traditions of, of thinking, but also a rich tradition that grows out of the European tradition of doing philosophy that gets transplanted into Mexico and then emerges and transforms in various distinctive ways on its own. So talking about the UC San Diego footprint, uh, I think this is unique about uh, UC San Diego and, uh, and uh, the kind of innovation we, are, uh, we want to be known for, and that's the Mexican philosophy lab. Uh, can you tell me why, what, the, what the Mexican philosophy lab is to begin with, but also why is it important? Uh, why is uh, it unique? And how are our students responding to it? Sure, I'll, I'll say a little bit about this. Uh, so the, the Mexican Philosophy Lab is a, uh, is a place and I, an idea uh, built around the thought that uh, there is an enormous amount of work to be done both on the research side, but also on the curricular side of developing the study of Mexican philosophy uh, here at UC San Diego. And, and part of the reason and the urgency for having something like this here is precisely that uh, we're on the border and we have an enormous number of students who are incredibly fired up about this. And, uh, and so these opportunities for us to get together, to, uh, to workshop, for example, translations, to bring speakers through who do presentations of work in, in progress, to think about ways in which we can leverage uh, the kind of growing capacity both here at the university and more widely among the community of scholars thinking about these kinds of things to begin to build up dialogue here internal to UCSD, dialogue across the country and also dialogue across the Americas about, uh, about the, 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 the live and, uh, and, and rich and fascinating work that's been done in this area. So I think of that as the kind of the, the principal animating uh, force behind the idea of the lab as a kind of a place for us to experiment with ways in which we can develop curriculum, develop research, and develop community of scholars who are, are focusing on ways in which we can, uh, by studying and mining these ideas, uh, invigorate discussions amongst ourselves and to take some of these ideas forward into how people think about and build communities and understand uh, the shape of their own lives and the shape of their own communities. Uh, so those, these are some of the, 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 the motivations uh, behind how we think about the lab and what the lab's up to. Yeah, I mean, I would just really like to emphasize, especially the community formation point. Um, I mean, there just doesn't exist. I mean, there's a, a couple of communities, uh, societies that are kind of loose affiliations of people working on related topics, uh, you know, in, in the States, uh, connecting, you know, some Mexico, some Canada. But uh, there was there hadn't been an uh, institutional home that just said, you know what, we're committing to really just name the focus of a research unit on Mexican philosophy in the States. And so we thought it's needed. We're excited about it. We do have a bunch of unique things to offer to, to kind of host it in some way. <clears throat> but we know, uh, you know, it's something that has to grow. So we're not going to call it a center. We're not going to try to make it a, a center or anything big. We'll just start with a lap, you know, because that seems very... 
uh, ground up and we'll just see what kinds of experiments can happen and what will grow out of it. And it's been amazing. I mean, we get, we've had people come, uh, you know, from all around the country who have research projects, who have translation projects. And, you know, now we see each other, I mean, now it's all on Zoom, but we see each other at other events and it, it is forging a community that uh, has a kind of center, uh, you, know, pull, you know, an anchor here in a real place and a real world-class institution. Um, and on the research side, I would say it's, we're also unique in that, um, you know, wanting to uh, incorporate translation and the narrative of the history of Mexican philosophy um, inside the department, the rest of the philosophy department has, you know, just excellent uh, scholarship on those fronts to model. So we have excellent translators of classical philosophical works, we have excellent historians of philosophy. And so, you know, we, I think Manuel and I both thought, you know, we have some skills in those too, but we have colleagues who will keep, keep the level really high, will push us to do even better. That was really exciting. That's a very unique uh, possibility. And then, you know, what Manuel mentioned about also the division, I mean, there's just a bunch of different interdisciplinary connections that we're, we're starting to see light up. Uh, we've been, we've co-sponsored a couple of events uh, with, you know, things in other par parts of the division. Um, I'm just trying to, again, be a place on campus uh, that can bring some of that conversation cycling through and uh, mixing in with the philosophy department. Uh, and, you know, I think it is also unique that we, we both have personal connections, research connections with UNAM, uh, so the, you know, the, one of the central universities in Mexico, Mexico City, uh, also other universities, uh, the University of Michoacan, uh, Manuel has connections even farther uh, south into Latin America. Uh, to bring that aspect, the dynamic of Mexico in relation to Latin America more broadly. Uh, so we, we do, we have a lot to offer in these early stages of a, for a lab. And I think, uh, cool that it will just, it has led, you know, starting to get some momentum, uh, you know, outside of just, you know, the small groups that have been meeting, uh, over the past year. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a, it's, it is a unique thing. And, and, and then one very concrete thing that it has led to is, this course that we've been uh, alluding to, this or uh, these two courses, one, of course, on Mexican philosophy, the, you know, I think the first upper level course that's just titled Mexican philosophy and uh, definitely the UC system and possibly, you know, anywhere nationwide. Um, and then this other course that is kind of rounding out the background, the philosophy and the Americas course. Um, also, you know, just us kind of bouncing ideas off, doing a bunch of collaborative research, you know, trading a bunch of books and links and, compiling and so it, in the concrete curriculum sense it's led to unique curricular developments too and i think you know not every uh research unit ar around the country can say you know not only are you doing research but we're it's translating directly into student interaction at a very uh real and interesting level on that note is mexican or latin american philosophy anti-racist and if it is how so so I, I think that there are uh, there are a couple of different ways to think about the uh, anti-racist reality and potentiality of uh, of Mexican and Latin American philosophy more generally. So one thing to think about is uh, just from a kind of canonical or curricular standpoint, the mere thought that uh, that non-European peoples have engaged in philosophy. Uh, is by itself a way of rewriting our understanding about who does philosophy, who does a certain kinds of abstract reflective thinking, and where we can find sources for inspiration about how we can collectively live together and what sorts of things we can hope to achieve. And so I think there's a way in which just the very act of, of teaching these things uh, is experienced oftentimes by students with a great deal of enthusiasm, partly as a way of, of living out that thought uh, of a kind of anti-racist curriculum and the possibility of expanding our conceptions of, of where uh, human visions for, for uh, collective meaning making can be found. So I think that that's one piece, but then internally to the kind of substance of Latin America and Latin American philosophy, I think it's, it's an exceptionally rich and fascinating place for thinking about race. So partly because there is a very, very ancient history. I, I mean, so at least 500 years of philosophers in Latin America repeatedly coming back to questions about who are we? Are there varieties of humankind? How do we describe and carve up distinctions amongst humankinds? And efforts in different countries to, to, to live out different visions about organization of people based on, on race or race-like classifications. And so 
Uh, so there's a way in which uh, familiarity with and thinking through the question of race in the Latin American context, a, a region that has a long history of being a multiracial region and in which countries have explicitly wrestled with these questions about how to understand their own internal racial identity and whether or not, for example, the concept of mestizaje, that is the concept of, of race mixing or culture mixing, whether or not this can do all the work that we would hope in order to, to eradicate senses of racial difference whether or not that gets replaced by something like colorism, where we keep track of color, even if we're not keeping track of race, uh, and what the legacies are for trying to grapple with, in cases, long histories of, uh, of oppression or slavery. So I, I think Latin American philosophers haven't tended to shy away from these questions and have tended to confront them relatively straightforwardly and treated them as live philosophical questions for which philosophers can and should have things to say about these questions. And, and that's the thing I think is uh, for, for philosophers who are interested in questions about race and community and identity, Latin American philosophy is hard to beat as a, as a resource for thinking through these questions. Um, but, you know, as Manuel was bringing up, it just, once you start getting into the discipline of philosophy, you realize, oh, it has its own history and sociology and lots of different forces are at work making the institution that you're getting into be the way that it is. Uh, and, but you also, despite all of that, get a sense of, you know, the universality of certain kinds of ambitions and strivings, or at least what it seems like uh, are, are everywhere there's people, there's people asking questions and looking for reasons. And so it just seemed totally impossible that there wasn't a rich tradition. And once you start poking, it does take a little bit of work, but not that much. Um, it just explodes. And so there's all the stuff, uh, you know, not available in English yet. We're hoping, you know, part of the, our project with the Mexican Philosophy Lab is to do research into, you know, reconstructing narratives in English, translating things that have already been researched that have already been done in Spanish or other languages, uh, primary text, secondary text, to make available the, you know, just a wealth of uh, philosophical thought um, and inspiring, especially on topics that I know that we're especially focused on with this, uh, our discussion today, questions about what it means to be a people, the identity of uh, um, communities and uh, the, the hard question of the very concept of race, what is it, uh, does it, you know, is it real? How does it apply? How does it apply? Does it still have a life today? Obviously it has some kind of life, at least in the uh, political action sphere. Um, what can we do with it? Is there anything positive that can draw out of it? One of the things that I think both Manuel and I are drawn to in uh, these, the traditions that are on the continent, but especially uh, in Mexican philosophy, is that some of these questions are front and center. It, it, it stays kind of anchoring the thought to lived experience and the lived experience of a community and these really hard, deep questions about what it means not just to be me or you know the kind of abstract Descartes thought about, I think, therefore I am, but what does it mean to be us and where do we all come from and where are we? Uh, very, very concrete questions that you know just have deep philosophical tentacles that go into all kinds of things. In terms of your students, I know that students are incredibly active uh, and aware of uh, the current anti-racism movement. movement. Are you seeing this in relation uh, to studying uh, Mexican and Latin American philosophies? How are the students responding at this particular time? So I'm teaching uh, Mexican philosophy uh, this term right now. And one of the things that uh, is, uh, is a continuous feature uh, over the, the past three or so years that I've been teaching Mexican philosophy here at UCSD is the, is the intensity and awareness with which students are addressing issues of race, anti-racism, and questions about how collectively we live together in ways that are respectful of difference, but that also don't paper over the fact of of sometimes real and deep differences of, uh, about how groups think uh, of themselves and what sorts of things they aspire to. So I think, uh, so, so here's a kind of a, a, a nice example is um, there is a, uh, a literature in uh, Latin American philosophy about uh, whether or not uh, appealing to the idea of race mixing can provide a solution for certain kinds of racial strife and whether or not race mixing might enable the, the uh, creation or attainment of a certain kind of, uh, of society that can leverage 
shared identification to access all sorts of cultural goodies that aren't bound by bias and, 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 and so on. But one of the nice things about having, uh, uh, about having these terrific students at UCSD and who are vividly aware of and engaged with social justice issues in their community, but also awareness of, of broader political issues uh, is that they come to these discussions as savvy readers of these discussions. So immediately the first time Ms. Disaki gets put on the table, there's gonna be a student in the class who says, yeah, but isn't this idea, it, doesn't it amount to a way of erasing certain kinds of minority identities or, or what sorts of pressures emerge from a pressure of pro-race mi mixing or a community that wants pro-culture mixing? Does this threaten minority groups and minority practices? And, and th that those questions emerge organically and naturally with our students where immediately the discussion moves to a a, a higher level where now we have, you know, now we've got the ideas on the table, but, but then the question is, what do we do with them? And, and do we like the ideas or can we build on them? Uh, this is one of the really wonderful things about the, the students we have here and, and the way in which they engage with this material. Well, maybe expanding your thoughts a little bit further. Um, in what ways can studying non-canonical philosophies broadly construed advance society? It's a very nice and broad question for a philosopher, Clinton. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good. No, I'll, I'll, I'll take it up. I mean, I think, you know, as far as advancing society, uh, so there's obviously, you know, getting a historical, historically affected consciousness through seeing these these uh, other traditions that aren't always front and center in the curriculum and the broad sense of history itself, which isn't always front and center in the curriculum. Um, and so those two uh, just broaden consciousness. But I think what is also uh, helpful is uh, with all of, uh, all of the people we do in that course, there is such a tight connection between um, the, all the authors that we, that we focus on, um, the thought, the thinking, the reflection, and uh, the, the immediate hope and uh, push to have to make change in society. So the, the people that were reading uh, during the encounter, you know, the 15, 1600s, Bartolome de las Casas, uh, the text that we read there is called In Defense of the Indians. And it's just a broad scale attack on all of the behavior and uh, rationalizations of the behavior of uh, the Spanish colonial powers in relation to the indigenous groups. And so it, it engages in a ton of philosophical reflection and lays out a clear vision of what, it's, what it means to be a person, how should we treat people. Also careful analysis of you Spanish uh, uh, rulers, you know, what do you say you believe and what, what are your values? And look, the indigenous people do even better at them than you, and yet you are just totally annihilating them as a people. How does that work? And it's not just a you know, merely philosophical question, it's a, philosophical work that has immediate, it hopes to have immediate consequence on change, you know, in that, in the course, we also read Frederick Douglass, uh, James Baldwin, Cornell West, I mean, so, you know, just figures uh, that are associated with um, thoughtful reflection and inspiration, but also commitment to social change. And so I think uh, this kind of course where we're reading a broadly and bringing together a bunch of different kinds of voices and approaches from the Americas, can give people not just models for thinking, but models for thinking about how thinking could really affect and change society in the concrete and the immediate uh, with the hope for the future. And so I think we're hopeful, you know, in the Mexican philosophy course too, uh, the Latin American philosophy course, that it's not just about voices and traditions, but it, it is about giving models for ways to go from philosophical reflection to change in society and how have people been able to do it successfully in the past uh, are there ways that we can inherit that and try to carry it forward to make the future even better? I am very glad that you mentioned the future and hope for the future because this is a great opportunity for um, my last question. And my last question is the question from uh, UC San Diego administrator. Look two years, five years from now, what are your hopes and thoughts about teaching and advancing and advocating for Latin America and Mexican philosophy? And how can I help? I, I think one of the things that is so exciting to me about teaching this material, about researching this material, is that uh, what comes out of some of this work 
is the, the uh, a set of questions that have to do with live possibilities about how should we think of the cultural mission of a group of people. And I think this is a live question today. That is, what do we want for, uh, for the United States? What do we want for North America? What do we want for Latin America? What sorts of things can we aspire to? And one of the exciting things about the tradition in Latin America in general and Mexico in particular is that you have all of these figures who keep coming back to this question. What can we hope for? What ought we to hope for? Uh, is all that we want uh, you know, liberty or freedom or do we want something else? Is there some other kind of thing that we should try to animate or, or have as a collective project for us, whether we think of it as something performed by the state or that we want a state to do, or whether or not we think of this as something that larger than state or smaller than state collective should aspire to do. And that sense of a cultural mission of trying to transform the conversation, uh, I think is something that emerges from the study of these sorts of things. And so when you ask me, what do I hope happens or what do I, uh, 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 what would I like to see years down, you know, whether three years or five years down the line, is I would love to see uh, that sense of conversation about a, a cultural mission or a project, uh, a project of a community or of a people or of a larger than nation state set of people uh, to become a, a more regular feature about our conversations. I mean, I take it that, that it's, it's not news to anybody that we live in a world riven by political disagreements and in which there's oftentimes not a lot of sense of, of cooperation and what sorts of things could we share as a collective project even in the face of disagreements. But I think when I, uh, when I think about what the payoffs are of doing Mexican philosophy, one of the payoffs of doing Mexican philosophy is that it puts these questions front and center and invites us to think about these things. So I would love to, over the next five years, for us to produce a generation of students who are coming out of UC San Diego, whether it's undergraduates or PhD students, who are alive to these questions, thinking about these questions and making them real and making these conversations real in the community at large in all the varied ways that, that the, the various disciplines and so on uh, and communities and places where these conversations could be had. So if that were to happen, I would think this is a sort of dream come true about the payoffs of thinking about these kinds of things to begin to animate these larger conversations about what we hope for. Thank you. Clinton. Yeah, just, uh, I mean, that was a, a wonderful answer. Uh, just a small thing to add. I mean, I, I think, you know, as, as, as was coming out, um, and, and I think in, your, in the way you put the question too, Christina, you know, it really touches on a sen uh, the sensitivity of the moment right now that uh, there's a lot, you know, with health, with politics, uh, just it's, it's un unclear what's going to happen next and who has any control <laughs> over it and what we can do individually, institutionally, um, and, you know, I think one of the things that it really is inspiring uh, working through the history of philosophy in the Americas uh, is that the Americas as, a, as an idea has always brought with it, um, you know, maybe dark times, but definitely dark times, uh, hardships, uh, difficult uh, questions and situations, uh, things that should be condemned, things that we hope never happen again in the history of humanity but also always a sense of hope that there's something that could happen. There's a place where it can happen. There's a uh, will for it to happen. There's imagination for imagining something better, a better place, you know, in, in the country's history, a more perfect union, always a more perfect union. Um, what is it to think of the Americas as, despite all of its uh, hor horrifying history, uh, aspects of the history, it could still be a place of hope and and can we uh find ways to strengthen our faith and we can do something different and it can be better and and where will those where will those resources come from uh i think uh we're hopeful that you know broadening the curriculum uh having a, a anchor point with uh some of the research groups on campus um that we'll be able to contribute to that to have ucsd be able to speak to uh not just our local community but to, to the nation and to the continents as really trying to hold out hope for the future, really trying to hold out uh, a, a way of bringing together faith in us. And as Manuel was bringing out a sense of us that we can have faith in to move forward and address these really difficult problems uh, intellectually, socially, culturally, politically. Um, so concretely, I mean, you know, we would love to uh, be able to uh, hire a bunch of other experts and have a, a live community in that sense, that would be wonderful. Um, we, you know, we're really confident that it, the students really do respond. And so we think 
you know, it, it is a growth area within uh, uh, curriculum and enrollment. Uh, and at the graduate level too, you know, I think Manuel and I both have had a bunch of people reach out to us as soon as they start saying, oh, this is happening. You know, we just start getting pings here, pings there. Uh, so, so I think our, 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 our little mini hope inside the department is, yeah, this will be a growth area and it will be kind of a source of new energy and yeah, hopefully uh, a new, new activity that will lead to, to good things to come. Great, everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks.